in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. And a promise that I'll make uh, right off the top is that I, I, I will not preach as long as that lesson was. <laughs> <laughs> or, or at least I'll try. Some years ago when I lived in San Francisco, I had a professional colleague, a woman who was then in her mid-40s. She had been married once and bemoaned the fact that she seemed to be continually playing the dating game. And I don't mean the television show. She told me that she really couldn't stand all the rituals of dating with its attendant awkwardness and such. But she admitted that it was kind of fun of getting to know different men. She once said an interesting thing to me that I have never forgotten. She said that when she gets to know a man, having cut through all of the small talk, and the conversation turns to the war, she needs to be certain that they're talking about the same war. <laughs> She said that that's important because she had the experience of once referring to the war of her youth, which was Vietnam, while her dating partner was referring to the war of his youth, which was Korea. Not the same war. Now, I understand the instinct behind my colleague's concern. Historical incidents provide a backdrop or frame of reference for our lives. Periods of time such as the 70s or the 60s offer such a backdrop. Culture, social position, and even geography provide similar frames <coughs> of reference. They provide instant recognition and familiarity. For me, born in the 1950s and came into maturity during the period of the late 60s, early 70s, the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., the draft lottery, <coughs> who remembers that? My number was 113 in a year when they took up to 85. The walk on the moon, Watergate, and even the breakup of the Beatles were critical events that placed my development in an historical context and informed my present worldview. Over time, I've sought friends and intimate relationships with people who share a common point of reference, if not the same point of view. Words cannot begin to describe how difficult it is to find people who have voted for as many losing presidential candidates as I have. <laughs> who among you remembers John Anderson? Yeah. Yeah, okay, there we go. In 1980, Anderson ran first as a Republican in the primaries and then as an independent challenger to Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan in the general election. And I voted for him each time. <laughs> As an apt commentary on the Times and on the major political party candidates, John Anderson actually got 6.6% of the popular vote. So maybe my viewpoint isn't as skewed as I sometimes think it is. Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. How could these two possibly relate? What could they have in common? Are they entering a courtship? What frame of reference did they share? The Samaritan woman comes to the well at an off hour. Rather than drawing water with the women of her village at either sunrise or at dusk, she draws her water at midday. Why alone? Why at that hour? Jesus is traveling from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. Though Samaria falls in between, it was entirely possible to avoid Samaria when traveling between these two destinations. Why did Jesus have to pass through Samaria when he could have avoided it? The story is framed by the historical, cultural, and religious antipathy between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were something of a hybrid race of people. They were descended from a small remnant of the tribes of the northern of the two divided kingdoms, that being Israel. They had escaped deportation by the Assyrian invaders in 722 BC. Subsequently, they had intermarried with the pagans from Babylon and Medea, who had been forcibly translated to Samaria by the Assyrians. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be a test later. 
Jewish hostility toward the Samaritans sprang from periodic attempts by the Samaritans to sabotage the rebuilding of Jerusalem after the return from the Babylonian exile. Later on, the Samaritans collaborated with the Seleucid kings in their wars with the Jews. In the tit-for-tat style reminiscence of the Middle East today, the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim in 128 BC. Now, on religious grounds, the two shared the five books of Moses as sacred scripture. But the Samaritans limited, limited themselves to the Pentateuch only, to nothing else. Both harbored the hope of coming Messiah. But where the Jews felt theirs would come from the line of David, the Samaritans anticipated a Moses-like prophet, leader. In short, the two just didn't get along. The Samaritans despised the Jews. The Jews thought that the Samaritans were half-breeds and, and to be avoided at all costs. Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Despite clashing frames of reference, they were destined to meet. And they met at a place which offered a shared historical point of reference, Jacob's well, a well which had sustained, sustained their common ancestors. In the encounter at the well, the Samaritan woman would begin to transcend her frame of reference and to enter a frame of reference beyond her wildest dreams. She came to the well to find the stuff of life. Jesus came to offer it. Now, it isn't easy for the woman to let go of her frame of reference. She knows that it's totally inappropriate for a man, especially a Jewish man, to be talking to her, asking her for a drink of water. She's surprisingly well-versed in the historical, cultural, and religious contexts that separate her from Jesus' people. She's also painfully aware of the ways in which she is socially removed from her own people by virtue of her knowledge of many men, which, in the Gospel according to John, is actually a metaphorical reference to the worship of false gods. The woman is a clever and spirited debater, when put on the defense, she knows how to change the focus of the discussion. <clears throat> She's nobody's fool. But Jesus is no ordinary debater. Cultural, historical, and religious frames of reference are of no concern to him. His agenda is to invite the Samaritan woman into a completely new frame of reference. It is a frame of reference in which living waters come not from a well, but from the divine person of Jesus. It is a frame of reference in which worshipers will no longer worship God on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem, but in God as revealed in the one who gives life, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says, I am. I am the one you're seeking. The woman has come in search of one of the staples of life, water, within her earthbound frame of reference. Jesus reveals to her a far deeper, richer alternative. I am the one who is the source of life, says Jesus. Not surprisingly, the woman, while incredibly intrigued by what Jesus has to say, doesn't immediately grasp the full meaning of his words. Though her heart has been jostled and roused, she can't quite let go of the frame of reference that has been her anchor and her source of awkward comfort in life. She is surely astonished by the supernatural knowledge which Jesus possesses and while she understands at some level that he is the fulfillment of her, that is to say, the Samaritan messianic expectations, she doesn't fully grasp the true meaning of Jesus' revelation. Nevertheless, filled with what she knows, the woman runs off to tell her friends in the village, leaving her water jar behind and empty. The townspeople return to the well, and in an act which clearly defies cultural norms, they ask Jesus to stay with them, and he does so for two days. During that time, they come to the knowledge of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, and they proclaim him to be the savior of the world. The depth of their faith experience is set on fire by the rather incomplete witness of the Samaritan woman. She was on to something about Jesus when she ran off to tell the townspeople what she had experienced, but she didn't fully understand the extent of what would be revealed to those who invited Jesus to stay. She witnessed to what she knew when she knew it. She did the best she could, and her testimony about Jesus was powerful enough 
to compel others to seek him out. Imperfect witness cannot be counted as an impediment to faith in God as revealed in Jesus. Let me say that again. Imperfect witness cannot be counted as an impediment to faith in God as revealed in Jesus. You don't have to know it all. And that's where Paul takes us today in the reading from Romans. Jesus doesn't wait for us to become perfectly faithful people. That would be an awfully long wait. <coughs> Jesus desires our faithful response in the fullness of our imperfect humanity within our earthly point of reference because that's precisely where Jesus has joined us. Jesus waits for us to question our assumptions about our faith, to begin the process of transcending our narrow earthbound boundaries, and ultimately to grow in faithful response to the love of God who waits for us. Like the Samaritan woman, we have continual and unlimited access to the bounty of God's love and grace through the life, death, and risen life of Jesus Christ. Regardless of where we are on our faith journey this Lenten season, Jesus is willing to meet us, to take on our burdens, lighten our load, and accept us as we are. My faith isn't perfect, and my bet is that yours isn't either. We continue to be bound by our various points of reference. Yet as seekers of light and life, we have the opportunity to meet Jesus at the well, and to call others to experience the transforming love and power of God in Christ. And please remember that when we're talking to our friends about Jesus, let's be sure we're talking about the Jesus who died on the cross so that we might live. Amen.